Well, welcome again, and thank you, Holly and Tamara and music folks, for making worship possible this morning, and everyone else that is helping out. We continue our series, Seven Signs of John, and this morning we're looking at the greatest call, and we are in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, and it is the story of Nicodemus. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished what I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, You are a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said, we're looking at the greatest call this morning in the series, The Seven Signs of John. Thought I'd start out with something a little humorous. Of course, it is Super Bowl Sunday. Heard about this guy who was out on the beach, and he was digging in the sand, and he found a lantern, and he rubbed the lantern, and a genie came out, and a genie gave him three wishes. And so... uh, the first wish, he said, well, I want a million dollars, and poof, he had a million dollars. And his second wish, he said, well, I want to go to the Super Bowl, and poof, he was at SoFi Stadium in uh, L.A., and uh, the genie said, well, you got one more wish left. And he said, you know what, I want to be irresistible to all women, and poof, he turned into a box of chocolates. <laughs> so public service announcement to everyone, it's not only Super Sunday, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. So... Anyway, uh, I don't know. You know it's Super Bowl Sunday. Anyone by a show of hands, how many are for the L.A. Rams? No one. All right. Bengals, by default. <laughs> how many just love the ads? I, I love the ads, too. Well, none of the teams that I predicted are in the Super Bowl, though I thought these teams were pretty good. But uh, we're looking at the greatest call this morning. And in the message this morning... I will use examples of faith from both teams, so we'll be sort of, you know, for both, all right? But um, I'm secretly pulling for the Bengals. But anyway, uh, I know that a lot of people will be saying, you know, what's the greatest call leading into this? A lot of, all, a lot of the commentary has already started on this, but then tomorrow everybody will probably say what the greatest call was today in the Super Bowl that will take place later today. And I'd like to walk back into the story because I think in the story is the greatest call of all times. And it is the story of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Now, he's a religious leader. He's someone who is uh, well taught, well thought of. Why do you think that he came to Jesus at night? John makes sure that we know that he came at night. Well, you can sort of hypothesize the size and think about it, but he was probably ashamed to be seen with Jesus. Jesus was controversial even at this point early in Jesus' ministry, and so he's ashamed to be seen with Jesus. I think that's at least part of it. And and I want to ask each of you, you know, are you sometimes ashamed of your faith, ashamed to stand up and say, hey, listen, I'm a follower of Christ. And I think that's an important thing for each of us to ask each other. I think maybe there's something else that's here too, which is that He had questions. And you know, a lot of us, 
We don't want to admit that we have questions and struggles, do we? I mean, not openly. And so he came to Jesus at night with some questions and some struggles. And that was Nicodemus, is the story opens up. But I want to just push pause on the story for a moment. And you know, I think the truth is that Jesus meets a lot of us at night, doesn't he? When we're struggling. Maybe even when we're ashamed of our faith, ashamed to stand up for Christ. But certainly when we're struggling with questions, with doubts, sometimes struggling with an illness, and everything seems dark as night. And we're forced almost to come to Jesus. And I don't know where you've been in the dark night of your soul, a moment maybe when you've come to Jesus because he's almost the last one who can answer that question. He's the last one that you can go to and just be with. But here's the most important thing maybe here as we begin this is that Jesus met Nicodemus at night. Jesus was there for them. What was Jesus doing out at night? I think Jesus was waiting for Nicodemus. I think John would whisper to us down through the ages that when we are in the darkest night of our soul, if we come to Jesus, Jesus will meet us there in the darkness. And so this conversation begins with Nicodemus asking Jesus a question about the signs. We're talking about the seven signs of uh, John, and the sign is not just a miracle but a message with it. And John uses this cue here, too, to remind us of this phenomena. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, we know you're a great teacher because you have these signs, right? And, and Jesus shifts that to, you know, signs and miracles to Nicodemus' heart. And he said, only the person who is born from above will see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is puzzled, as you and I should be. Now, uh, he says, well, wait a second. Can you be born again even if you're old, right? And so that's where we get the phrase born again. It's actually said born from above, but either is good because it is born again. And Jesus begins to explain to Nicodemus that flesh can only conceive flesh and the spirit can only conceive the spirit, which does sound kind of ambiguous, doesn't it? And so he begins to talk about the mystery of being born from above. Now, I do think that is a beautiful, beautiful scripture verse, isn't it? And so he begins to unfold things to Nicodemus. But here's the great truth is that the light comes at night, I think, even for Nicodemus. And as Jesus begins to unfold this to Nicodemus, he gives him that greatest verse of all time, right? John 3.16, right in the heart of the story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Wow, what a powerful, powerful verse. And for Nicodemus, I know that he struggled with that. And I think in our own lives, sometimes we struggle with uh, what it means to have faith and what it means to receive that message that God does love us and that God wants us to know forgiveness and grace and mercy and to keep it number one in our life. And most of us do struggle with some priorities in life, don't we? Uh, my daughter and I, we sort of began the Super Bowl season when we've been looking for it all week long, but we began it kind of last night with a movie. I don't know if you've seen the, the movie uh, Home Team. Anyone? Uh, sort of a, yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. And it's about Sean Payton and uh, played by Kevin Hart, who's always funny. It's a, it's a great comedy, but it's a true story based on Sean Payton, who's the, who, uh, the coach of the New Orleans Saints and coach, obviously, Drew Brees. But uh, at one point in his, his life, of course, Sean Payton and Drew Brees took the Saints to the Super Bowl, won the Super Bowl. I mean, took the Saints from last, you know, from the, the devastation of Hurricane Katrina right to the Super Bowl. It was really, it was such an amazing story. And I was down there in New Orleans and felt some of the excitement of that and I didn't go to the Super Bowl. But uh, it was pretty amazing. But somehow along the way, he sort of lost his way, lost his priorities. Now, both Sean Payton and Drew Brees, of course, very strong faith. But at one point, he was accused of having players uh, sort of hit uh, people and try to take him out with an injury. And I don't know all that unfolded, but he was suspended for a year. And so he uh, couldn't have contact with the Saints and his football team. And so he goes back to his hometown. And he's, he's divorced. And uh, he's sort of estranged from his, his kid, right? But his kid's playing football. And so he becomes a football coach for uh, his kid's football team. And it, it's really funny because there's sort of a men in the ways. And he's kind of learned some truths and get back to it. And uh, they didn't win the Texas, North Texas championship, but they came really close. 
Dallas. But he had a kind of real alignment of his values, right? And the trophy he got, he put right next to the Super Bowl trophy. And so it's interesting because, you know, sometimes we do lose our values and our priorities in life, which is to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. But as I look at the Super Bowl this morning, there are some people that are really shining examples on both sides of the ball that uh, really shine with their faith as we think about what does your faith mean to you and have you accepted the greatest call? And uh, the first one is Cooper Cup. Now, I know everybody's talking about both quarterbacks or super quarterbacks, right? And, uh, of course, Matthew Stafford on the, on the one side for L.A. But, you know, that every quarterback's got to throw to receiver, right? And L.A. does have the most phenomenal receiver I, I maybe I've ever seen in my life. You know, and I know lots of phenomenal receivers. But Cooper Cup is the first receiver to catch for over 2,000 yards in a single season. I mean, that is just phenomenal beyond measure. And he also got the, the triple crown, which the triple crown, I didn't even know this, is to lead the league in receptions, to lead the league in receiving yards, and to lead the league in receiving touchdowns. And he won that, which is phenomenal. But beyond that, this young man, this is young, um, is a great Christian. And I don't know if you saw that he was, he's got his own apparel line, but I, I saw it at the, uh, as they won the championship game, they were trying to give him, you know, the championship, the, you know, division championship hat, and the hat that he on, had on before he put the other one on, but they were trying to get him, but he wanted to show that first, uh, was great, because on it, it says this, do it to get a crown that will last forever. That's what he had on the front of his hat. Do it for a crown that will last forever. And it comes from Corinthians 9.25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it for a crown that will last forever. And he went on to say that his motivation in every game is to honor God, including the Super Bowl this afternoon. And I just think, I just hats off to him, uh, literally for standing up for his faith and remaining true to his faith through all of the commotion and all of the, you know, the stardom that comes with being part of the Super Bowl and being part of a winning team. But he's managed to keep his faith first in line. And, and honestly, then on the other side, because that's for the L.A. Rams, right? And I promised I'd get the other team in, which is the Bengals. I never thought the Bengals would get there. I even told you something. I said, I like the Bengals, sort of, because I'm from Pittsburgh. But uh, <laughs> I like the Bengals. But, you know, two weeks ago, it was all about the two offenses, wasn't it? I mean, you two high-powered quarterbacks, how much they could score. And you said, well, you know, it's uh, Mahomes. And uh, Joe Burrows, who's this phenomenal quarterback, I was taken out last year because of injury, but take Cincinnati from uh, four and twelve to winning season, and so these guys can just light it up. And of course, uh, Joe Burrows, Heisman Trophy winner, took LSU to championship game, and so it was all about that. But uh, Kansas City, you know, was just unstoppable, and Mahomes, you know, just lighting the place up. And so the first half, you went through that, and you thought, well, it's over. I mean, it is over for the Bengals. But you know what the story of the second half was in overtime? Bengals defense. Bengals defense. Like they showed up and said, no, we're shutting it down. Even this high-powered uh, Mahomes, who's phenomenal, who's also a great Christian, by the way. And uh, so th they shut that down, and then they took over the game in overtime to go on and win it. Don't know what happened today, but one of the great uh, players on that uh, defensive uh, group is a guy by the name of Trey Hendrickson. He's the Bengals' defensive end, and uh, a, a great guy, great Christian. And he said this about winning, uh, being part of the Pro Bowl, being honored for that. He said, it's a tremendous achievement. I've worked very hard for it, but I mean, I feel like I'm just ready and thankful, and I give thanks to Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's an emotional experience. You have to sacrifice a lot, but my faith is most important to me. And he goes on to say in his Instagram, he highlights uh, uh, Matthew 25 Ministries in Cincinnati, which is this ministry to the homeless and those who are hungry. And uh, one of his favorite verses is Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Well, both these guys, great faith, and I don't know who you're rooting for, but it's all about really in the, when the lights are on and the TVs are running, you know, where's your faith? What's the priority? So many of us get lost. 
But in this moment, whatever the greatest call is today, this play, John 3.16, let's call it, and I know you'll see it at the game, and sometimes it suffers from overplay, but have you forgotten what this really means in real time? The Father, the creator of everything that is, knew that we had gone astray and that we couldn't make things right on our own. And so he sent in his only begotten son to us, to earth, to take on our humanity, knowing that only he could show us the way to life, could love us enough to lay down his life on Calvary that we would know forgiveness and grace and bridge the gap between ourselves and God, to balance the scales between love and justice and make everything right. And only Christ could do that. And only love could accomplish that. So it brings together both the Super Bowl and Valentine's Day, which is super, super important as well. But I wonder where you are. When you see John 3.16 today, when you're watching the Super Bowl, it'll be there. We just go, oh, I've seen that a million times. Doesn't mean much to me anymore. I heard the kids say it in Sunday school. But what does it really mean to you in your heart and life today? Because Jesus was willing to give it all, and that greatest call, not just of a game, but of all eternity, to come as one of us and give his life on the cross, that we would know God's forgiveness and God's amazing grace and love. Today, where are you with the greatest call? Well, I know there's a few of you out there that have got your hands folded and say, well, I don't like sports. Well, If you don't like sports, and even if you do, if you're more of a philosopher than a theologian, I'll close with this story. Karl Barth is perhaps the greatest, many say the greatest theologian of the 20th century. He wrote volumes. I don't know anybody who's ever read all of Karl Barth. But he also served in many great ways. He served as a prison chaplain. He was the lead theologian that wrote the Barman Confession that led the resistance against Hitler in World War II and was willing to risk his life as a signer and really the writer, primary writer of the Barman Confession. And following the war, of course, he continued to write, he continued to stand for some of the great principles of the Christian Church, our United Church of Christ, very much a part of the same denomination that's over in Germany and in Switzerland. But he traveled, and one time and later in his life, he was at Harvard University, prestigious university, and he gave a lecture and... Uh, at the end of the lecture, there was a Q&A, and he took some questions, and a number of questions had to be fielded. But along the way, a young man stood up and said, well, Dr. Bart, you're a great theologian and philosopher, and we just want to know, what is the greatest theological truth of all times? Without missing a beat, he said, well, that's really easy. Jesus loved me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And I think that is the greatest truth from perhaps the greatest theologian, one of them of all times. Today, whether you are looking at the sports screen or whether you're looking at some of more of the academic things, the greatest call in all of history is real simple. It's right here in this verse today. Don't let John 3.16 suffer from overplay, because it is the greatest call. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for the greatest call, which comes from the greatest love of all time, which is the love that you have for us, the love that our Lord and Savior has for us willing enough to love us so much to come as one of us and lay down his life on Calvary that we would know forgiveness and the promise of eternal life. So help us to open our hearts and lives to your amazing love and to live as sons and daughters of you. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen.